Welcome to the Sonship Podcast. I'm your host, Danny Atias. Today's person with purpose is Harriet Green, OBE. Harriet, welcome. Thank you. Harriet, uh, Harriet was the CEO and chair of IBM Asia Pacific uh, and previously Thomas Cook as well. Someone who's always inspired me and it's just always been led by purpose and, and thinking about people and the environment and society and what you do. And now you're, we're, we're both actually involved in, in a, a social impact startup called Mission Beyond, which I hope we'll hear a lot about in a, in a moment. Um, so thank you very much for coming. I'll start with the opening question that I always start these mm. podcasts with, which is about your Sonder moment. So to remind people, uh, Sonder is that, it's that moment, it's that feeling when you realise that everyone's got their own story. It's not just your own story that's happening uh, for, for your own environment, but you realise that every random passerby have got so much going on, highs and lows and experiences. Um, and it's, it's when you, it's, it's that awakening, I suppose, when you realise it's more than just about you. And given the way you conduct yourself and everything that you do, Harriet, uh, I know that you think about other people all the time. Mm. And with your experience working across four different continents as well, mm. you must have so many different experiences mm. to share. So what's your earliest or, or most memorable Sonder moment? Well, thank you, Danny. I appreciate very much being asked. I've watched all of the episodes of um, uh, Sondership and, and your moments, so I was thrilled uh, uh, to be asked to, to do this. I'm going to disappoint you to a degree, I fear, in that I don't have a moment. Um, I have a layering of experiences that sort of came together to shape uh, who I am and the journey that I've taken. And I'll describe those distinct layers that have come together to create the sort of skin or the permafrost or whatever uh, uh, made up of these particles, these, uh, these layerings. So the first piece is locational. So I was brought up in a very tiny village in the middle of the Cotswolds. Um, the Cotswolds is a very rich county, has been for a thousand years. And so feudalism exists perfectly. Lords of the manors, uh, those who support and uh, us who don't own land, etc. Et and um, I think one of my first moments about difference and about location is this was big fox hunting country. People on amazing horses in red breeches and red jackets and other such things. And my father um, thought that this was um, an abomination. And so in the middle of fox hunting country, we would each Saturday morning with our little placards um, say how bad fox hunting was. And so you begin to feel a sense that you're different from those around you. It was positive prote uh, protest, uh, it was informed protest, but it was not really welcome uh, uh, protest. The second piece uh, of layering was around, then my father became very, very ill. And my mother was so keen for him to be home and that she and we could take care of him in this tiny little village. And the other side of village life came to play, how people come together to make you cakes, to make sure you walk home, just the sheer unmitigated kindness of other people around you. And what a difference those tiny acts for my mother, for me and my siblings as my father, you know, became um, increasingly unwell uh, and, and sadly died. The third piece of layering was a realization that what other people did in the Cotswolds was marry young farmers. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> I was actually never asked, which was, you know, important to state here. Uh, maybe if I had been, things would have been different. But I realized the power of my education and that if I was going to ever, any day, own some land or do some good, I had to exit 
this place. But perhaps the piece that has had the greatest impact on me um, came when just before my father's death, um, our phone was cut off. Uh, we had no sort of um, income as such. And it, these were in the days when your landline could be cut off. Yeah. And uh, my mother's horror that the cost of putting the phone back on was actually more than we owed. And, um, you know, I was in my early teens and my mom, hardworking, desperately looking to take care of my father. And I was, I was angry. I was really outraged that someone would do this to us, that we had no phone. Who was she going to call? There were no mobiles or, you know, we had to run to the nearest neighbor. So we often got on the bus from our little village to go to Cheltenham, where in the center of Georgian Cheltenham is was the GPO headquarters in the days when that's where you paid your bills, etc. And without telling my mom, um, I visited the GPO and with a loud voice expressed my anger to pretty much everyone in the entire GPO office, which was huge. Uh, that this was not right, not fair, not what you did to people. And I remember my mother's reaction to that. My mother would never have done that. Mm. And so having a voice and using it for good from a very early age um, has helped shape me with those other elements. The end of that story is not good. They did not put the phone back on. We did not have a mobile. And I think in hindsight, I might have approached it very differently. But the combinational elements of those pieces kind of defined me for, you know, my full second decade going to university, going to work. And often I think about those elements. That's amazing. Such a, a rich tapestry you've shared, Harriet. Thank you so much. You've got this mental image of the mm. kind of fox hunting in its glory, picturesque, and not in terms of the, the, the function, the really. Act. <laughs> the act. Um, and it's, it's also really interesting. We, we've talked recently about purpose and how you find your purpose. And, and one of the things that we talked about is what makes you angry. And so it's, it's you know, young Harriet there at that moment at mm. home, uh, just realizing the injustice I suppose of of it costing more to put your phone back on than you owed and and you're being cut off from from the rest of society and the rest of the mm -hmm. world so um the wonderful that it it's not just sparked the anger but sparked action and and as you say you know as we grow we learn uh, about different ways to approach things and, and how to get our way but just having that drive to uh, be able to go in and take on an establishment at such a, a young age from a from the, the background, kind of farming type background that, that you've, you've come from. Not, not, not that I know with your family was specifically yeah. farming, but, but that environment. So that's, that's really wonderful, wonderful. So what I'd really like to, to understand is a bit more of your journey and, and, um, how you were able to fold this sense of purpose and the sense of helping people uh, and making a difference through the work that you've done. Um, so where, where was mm. it you went to university? Was it in the UK? Yeah, well, I, I came to university here in London and uh, this theme of voice comes through. And um, I, uh, I, I started uh, reading law mm. and I really didn't like that. I didn't like the sort of structure and the repetition and I transferred to medieval history. So I spent a great deal of time in the vaults at Senate House in a very small group, uh, peripatetically studying uh, medieval history. But there's another example of voice that um, I think has been an important theme for me as well, something I believe in profoundly, um, which doesn't come from medieval history or indeed the law, but maybe just having this, I don't know what it is, this, this sense that I have a voice and I should be able to use it. So um, here in in London and the History Society is very strong and 
at the time there was a writer um who was doing the rounds uh we had many great speakers tony ben and you know uh many people came to speak here in, in london's many universities uh particularly at at king's and um this particular historian wrote uh books that suggested that the holocaust was um really a feature of others imaginations and um was really not to be taken seriously and as a member of the history society and part of the council i felt very very strongly that um he should come like other people and speak uh and we could all then collectively uh the jewish society the history society everyone else do what we had done to others um which was question and really show that factually and accurately you know this was wrong um but um that was not what the university decided to do uh and the view was that we should not allow him to speak and so my view of freedom of speech that is um uh uh you know not violent and ranting and ill-informed i mean it clearly was ill-informed and and the books but they were books that were written and published that view of voice and freedom of speech that can then uh uh be argued and dealt with in an you know intelligent way rather than people just going off and writing more uh of this inaccurate uh uh opinion but it is surprising how that issue of freedom of speech uh uh the cancer the the cancel culture mm. has pervaded as i've worked and run everywhere you know from indonesia mm. to a uh, korea to india that that voice issue is, is very important so that was formative in my journey because i i lost the battle for freedom of speech it became something that i didn't realize was important to me i felt he would come and talk and we would all say this is complete rubbish these are the facts this is the evidence this is what the jewish society believes is right and they would uh, uh respond to it so you know these are profound things that happen when you're not yet 20 yeah this uh, i mean lots of kind of shit was going down my arms i could see i could see <laughs> what would you have if you'd been in my position would you have stopped it, uh, him from speaking i think your natural instinct would would be to stop but then it's that considered approach as a as a jew of north african descent you know yes. my my family have have experienced these the things firsthand and um i think what's really interesting there are a couple of things that come out of this for me one is you you uh went up against the telephone company and you failed and then you went up against your university about free speech and you failed <laughs> and and that's really important and and especially for anyone young listening you know yeah. failures are the, the bedrock of of learning and and growth and if you don't have those failures then quite frankly you're playing it a bit too safe aren't you you're not finding the limits and the boundaries i i would say i think um i i think you're absolutely right and you've seen the the criticality of those connections <laughs> i am however the type of individual who never really considered them as failures <laughs> that these were you know their loss yeah uh, uh actually with the phone company it was never anyone's but my mom's loss but um but that you pick yourself up yeah. you take the learnings from this and you gather a sort of strength from and i always think it's me that i should have done better mm. that i should have presented more cogently i certainly know that one learning uh at that time with the university is i should have taken more one on ones mm. more um you know individual discussions rather than the oratory of trying to persuade the entire university and its leadership that you know this was um you know the the right thing to do so i think if you're if you are driven and you are naturally resilient because of what has befallen you in in your early years if you believe in confucian theory as i i kind of do um you 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 believe that you have to improve mm -hmm. i never considered uh uh that it was other people's failings i have to be better i've been gifted with this voice 
and you know a, an education that people around the world would die for in a country that protects our freedoms and liberties on the whole um uh and i have to do better so i'm not sure i considered it failure uh, because that's just my my nature <laughs> but the learnings are intense and that's what i always say you know with with our children with 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 family with the the teams of people that work for me okay what what can we learn from this mm. you know but your other point is something that i profoundly believe and i don't know much about sport even in this country when i went to live in the states you know i had to learn uh you know sports stuff in the town i was in who plays in miami is it bounce bounce throw is it hockey is it what is it and and study them before i would talk to people but when gretzky uh who is a famous ice hockey coach as everyone seems to know people say why do you say that afterwards so, you know but <laughs> i didn't know i, I didn't know <laughs> he he says that <clears throat> 100% of the shots you don't take on goal won't go in. Yeah. And I believe that. And if you, you know, if you can if you can survive losing the most important person in your life, your father, if you can take on the GPO and fail, take on London University and fail on something kind of like that. Um then, you know, keep going and and keep just expanding your own envelope of what you can and can't do. Mm. Let, let's go a little deeper on your your work across four different continents mm. and how working in different societies has changed the way that you approach purpose or changed the way that you approach yourself, your your your, your outlook on life and and what you do. Yeah, I think um, experiencing living, working in different countries of the world uh, as a as a leader as a citizen makes you sort of rounder uh, and and richer. Uh, I think people around the world are, are mostly the same. I think there are uh, people get up in the morning, they want to do great work and they want to be well led and they want to have purpose and, and feel good about what they do. I think in, in Asia, where I've spent a lot of my career, that sense of teenage energy you know they don't know what they don't know and we can achieve anything which is the sort of hallmark of developing nations is is wonderfully invigorating the challenge is if things start to go a little bit wrong people unravel as quickly as they sort of excite um, north america i think it's kind of essential i've lived and worked there to understand compensation. I'm not saying that greed is good in America, but, uh, you know, uh, how one is incented to do things is extremely important. But that same extraordinary worth e uh, work ethic uh, is, is very strong. And then in Europe, a more mature environment where, you know, trying to create differentiation and maybe cut through cynicism, been there, done that, know how to do it. I think that you know, the, the acts of any one individual can be powerful. But I've also seen across the world where, you know, purpose-led corporations, companies like IBM, take their scale and digital and how we reached 4 million teachers and a million young women across India uh, to help aid STEM skills, uh, equip them with not only uh, technology, but capability and learning, you know, the, the ability to do good uh, uh, is almost li limitless at large scale, at kind of medium scale, and, and we can talk at, at sort of startup level. But I think, you know, that sense that I remember as my first public company CEO ship in the UK with an amazing uh, chairman. Uh, and, and my, my first strategy paper, this is uh, 2006, to the investors, you know, who own the company was people, planet, profits. And some of those, um, of course, it's all changed now, investors who said, yeah, really interesting, Harry, let's get to the profits. <laughs> and uh, now, of course, uh, EDI, ESG, all of those metrics have become fundamental in the decision making for um stakeholders to buy in uh, to organizations, which I think shows progress just in my own uh, 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 short lifetime. That's really wonderful. So at 2006, you're talking about these things. And 
It, it's interesting you talk about IBM and, and being purpose driven. Well, most people wouldn't think of IBM as a purpose driven. They just think of IBM as a big technology behemoth. Um, but actually we are seeing that organizations like IBM and, and Microsoft more recently as well are really starting to focus on that. Because- well, IBM would say, you know, in fairness that 110 years, uh, uh, which is, um, longer than any other company in tech and most other companies is because of the purpose of the organization, that IBM's below the waterline and above the waterline of developing, investing, whether it's P-TECH programs, you know, corporate citizenship programs where employees work around the world, that its ability to have this longevity is its ability to change and provide purpose (coughs) for its vast numbers of employees. So this is not some tech fad, uh, you know, uh, and sadly, many, many tech organizations are not diverse, are not inclusive, and hardly stand the test of time. Certainly. And um, in previous episodes, we talk a lot about artificial intelligence. And again, this is not a technology podcast, but we talk about the impact of diversity in the people who are designing artificial intelligence and training it, because it's going to impact all of our lives totally so harriet let's um let's talk about mission beyond Hmm. um it's 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 nascent stage at the moment tell us about what it is yeah so um a whole range of people including your good self from corporations individuals uh units government came together to really talk about as a coalition based on the uh the sort of uh thoughts of uh uh, uh, many that the way that you tackle some of the world's big problems is in a strong coalition. And we worked together, identified that social mobility, particularly the part of social mobility, it has five life stages, from education to work would be an area of greater uh, uh, focus. And so um, by talking to everyone that provides support in this area, coaching, uh, mentorships, internships, apprenticeships, jobs. Um, we came up with a digital platform, uh, uh, Open Doors. We developed uh, an amazing MVP, uh, uh, Red Badger, a digital consultancy helped us work on that, really working with the beneficiaries. How do they build their confidence, their knowledge, their CV, their skills, a sort of a career advisor in your pocket? How do we put all of the SMEs, the coaches, the, the supporters, the, the charities, the NHSs with all their jobs onto this ecosystem? And most importantly, the corporates who, with the best will in the world, want to hire people that don't look like the white <clears throat> Aryan males from eight universities that they hire today. And so creating this marketplace, this ecosystem, which is so much more than a jobs board because young people can keep this in their, in their, on their phone, uh, uh, um, and provides them with a journey of confidence to financial independence. And boy, is the timing right now. Anyone who was underrepresented or disadvantaged before this vortex of change, before the technology change, the pandemic, the the climate change and the need for deep, deep uh, inclusion and diversity, they're even less represented uh, uh, now. So we're out there, a large part of my day, trying to get funding to take this amazing MVP uh, from the most brilliant demo uh, uh, into um, uh, 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 a platform marketplace with all of the real-time data, all of the security, all of the AI that we need to help young people. Uh, Many have helped us get where we are. It really is a powerful example of uh, a coalition at work to solve a problem. And our goal uh, is with the first phase of funding to get a million young people uh, and a thousand SMEs and corporates coming together in this marketplace for good. So we're very excited, as you can tell. I, I, I'm also excited. <laughs> I, as an employer of um, technology staff, uh, we've recently gone out to try and find apprentices for entry-level roles. And it's been quite hard. It's not 
easy. It's not been readily available. And there are some organizations doing some stuff there, but they're also charging a lot of money for it. And you just think, how much are you trying to profit versus how much are you trying to really give people a, a leg up? So I think this is something that's just so incredibly And thank essential. you. I mean, you've been such a powerful part of that coalition, giving advice. You know, you're a pretty, uh, pretty rock star leading CIO yourself uh, in the UK. And so the influence that you can have in others trying to, you know, if we can do this with a platform, a digital platform that provides scale and security and information here, we can use it in many, many other areas. So, you know, it takes an entire village, a tribe Mm -hmm. to do this. uh, And you've been a part of it. So thank you. Thank you, Harriet. Harriet, let's finish up with just your thoughts on on leading with purpose. Just um, what, what from from all the experience you've had across these continents and across these organisations and these social startups, what what would you tell people who are in the humdrum, the day to day, and thinking, I want to add more value. I want to. I want my purpose to lead what I do. What what advice would yeah. you have? I've got sort of two pockets of advice. The first is. You know, as an individual, any one of us can lead with our heart and be more interested, more kind, more providing allyship, whether it's seeing someone, you know, shouted at in the street, someone rolled over in a meeting, you know, we all can have a voice if we choose to. It doesn't matter whether you're an introvert, an extrovert. It doesn't matter whether you know a huge amount about the LGBT plus community, whether you don't know if someone is, is you know, Jewish or had free school meals. It doesn't really matter. Leading with your heart on a daily basis can make an amazing difference. On a more structured level, the questions that I, as an employee, as a citizen, uh, ask every single day in any company that gets my money or I have to coexist with, it is about the psychology, the physiology and the anatomy of your commitment to purpose. First of all, where is your um you know, your psychological commitment as a company or a government or as an organization. Where is your diversity and inclusion plan? Where is your volunteering plan for people? If it was a new product, where is your climate change plan? What are you leading with as that unit? What uh, What is supposed to capture the hearts and minds of a young individual? Oh, well, we're not sure about working from home, you know, kind of work its way out. This is a time to lead. And I think leaders have got to step up and really be bold and be much more brilliant. Secondly, the physiology. Are you having, when you interview people, a diverse slate? What are all these, you know, Asian women and no different, you know, community represented. Where are the processes and the practices that hire people uh, because they're great, not because they went to a school or you think they come from a good family? And how are those, how is that uh, physiology, nerve endings, blood flows, the IT stuff, how does it drive purpose? And then finally, it's the piece about anatomy. What is the structure of your business? I am a huge believer in if you can see it, you can be it. When I was running businesses across Asia Pac, uh, across 14 countries, half of the executives were women. That means that a young woman who wants to join the company can look up and say, my leader in Malaysia is a woman. My leader in uh, 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 this part of India is a woman or uh, is, is um, you know, someone who is not, you know, if I can see it, I can be it. And it removes all the sense of doubt, of unconscious bias uh, and of prejudice. And so psychology, physiology and anatomy, we can all ask those questions. We can be the person with a better end result in the GPO office saying, excuse me, why have you done this? And the power of employees, 
uh, uh, today, every single employee has a voice to ask those questions. And if they're not satisfied, they have a choice. And so all of us can vote for purpose and be part of the change that we want to see in the world. Every one of us. That's perfect. Thank you very much, Harriet. The importance of role modelling is so critical. And thank you for being such an amazing role model for so many people, women across the world. Um, thank you very much, Harriet, for being on the Sunship Podcast. It's my great pleasure. Thank you. That's it.